A person who spends his life as a concert pianist often has to spend a lot of time in front of a piano. I wonder if it ever gets to feel like a cage like that bird. <laughs> well, maybe that's why I, I hang it mm -hmm. uh, there. Uh, sometimes it, it is very heavy, it's very demanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes one is so pressed to accomplish uh, a piece of music that it feels like uh, you, are, you are in a cage mm -hmm. because uh, you are attached to it mm -hmm. until you, are, you grab the meaning of the piece. Mm -hmm. You gave your first concert when you were 12 years old. Uh, did the uh, great genius of that destroy your discipline at all at, at that early age? No, not at all. Uh, I always had this great facility that uh, perhaps was uh, something that I got from birth. I, I don't know, I don't think so, but I had a facility mm -hmm. to listen to music and to, especially to play the instrument. And uh, it gives you this feeling of uh, power, of being able to, to do things easily. But uh, when you get to a professional, high professional level, and you are trying to achieve the most, then you begin realizing that the facility means nothing. It's only the work that you put on the piano and, and uh, of analyzing yourself, of analyzing your reactions. Mm -hmm. uh, playing an instrument is a set of conditioned reflexes. Mm -hmm. And you have to condition your, your reflexes, the reflexes of your fingers, to fit the musical idea. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, very involved, difficult task. It's a physical task and it's a, it's a mental task. And there are psychological problems always of trying to uh, convey one to the other and have the other respond to what has been conveyed to, to it. Yeah. How do you do, uh, sit here alone and determine whether you've done something well or done something poorly? Is there something, do you know right away whether you're, you're on or, or off? Yes, uh -huh. yes. I, uh, that's one of the things that I learned during my training. At, at Juilliard and before Juilliard. And that, that was one of the things that when I came to study with Madame Levine, for instance, she always stressed that self-analysis uh, and, and the ability to be able to hear uh, to yourself, to hear what you are producing on the instrument is, is of, of prime importance. Uh, of course, I have a very good uh, second pair of ears that is called a tape recorder mm -hmm. but, uh, that I use uh, very much. But uh, especially I have learned, I think, to listen to myself, to, to listen to what comes out of the instrument. You see, the, the problem with playing an instrument is that you are so much physically involved with the instrument and when you are struggling, to obtain a result uh, physically, uh, technically, you get so involved into it that your ears or your, the part of the mind that is involved with the hearing is lost at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the problem with the students, and that, that they, they, ha they struggle through a passage and they lose the consciousness of the sound that comes out of the instrument. Uh, the production of tone, for instance, which is part of the technique, the color of the tone uh, also responds to the hearing of a person and to the understanding of the phrase, of the musical phrase. And I think that through the severe training that they have had, they have made me understand that the musical phrase is the ultimate thing, that is the goal. The, the technical aspects of obtaining the sound out of the instrument is just something that you learn, something that you train yourself to do, and something that you should have it as ingrained in you so it will, 
you will be free to think on music, not to think on movements of your body. Okay, could you show us a little of this subtlety, this color and tone differences here on the piano? Certainly, I will try to show uh, the differences in tone, color, and in some other aspects of, of the interpretation of music. For instance, we have here the first Mozart Sonata, Kegel 279, and the, I will try to play it devoid of any feeling and the devoid of any color. I don't know if I can uh, achieve that because it, it's, it's so ingrained in, into me, but I will try. And the, the way I, or any person who understood the meaning of this music would play, I think would be closer to this. So the difference in the uh, quality of the tone, uh, the quality of, of the intensity, the, the, the going towards this uh, important part of the, the, the climax of each musical phrase, which will give the syntax of the musical phrase clearly to the audience, uh, I, I hope it was in, in, in what I did the second time. But is a, we must understand that uh, there are different ways of conveying the same thing. For instance, a, a basso profundo could come and tell you, uh, the sky is blue, and the, a tenor would tell you, the sky is blue, and the, the, perhaps a, a soprano would come and say, the sky is blue, I, I, I can do it. So they are all tell you, telling you the same thing, the sky is blue. And the syntax of that phrase is always the same. So is in a musical phrase. So it's not a question that is open up to interpretation. It is clearly stated by the composer. It's up to the individual to render it in, in, in the way the composer wanted. And, and there are acoustical reasons for this. There is something that we call the, uh, the harmonic rhythm. That is how the harmonies change. The chord, the chordal structure of the piece changes according to the rhythm. And we will see that that creates a certain sense of motion. It creates also the, the syntax of the phrases because uh, the agogics, the, the climaxes of the phrases, are going to coincide with these important changes of the harmony in general. And, and that's what we have to understand when we say obviously the, we are going there and the tension is building to that point and from that point is letting off. It's like Stravinsky said, music is a succession of phrases of climaxes and releases. And if it wouldn't be that way, it would be a bore. Okay, you've been talking about music, but the arts are also, uh, the visual arts are also part of your life. How do these uh, paintings uh, affect your music? Well, uh, I have always been uh, in, in the artistic circles, and I have had very many friends. Uh, for instance, the painters who painted this, this is uh, Luis Solari is a painter from Uruguay. Mm -hmm. Liliana Porter is a painter from Argentina. Mm -hmm. And the, I always consider that an, an artist of any discipline should be very much in contact with all the artistic disciplines that exist in our society. 
that enlightens uh, one's own art. And uh, that is why in my, in my house I always have uh, so much uh, art and paintings and uh, uh, even in one place, uh, I, I remember I was on tour in uh, South America, this place was in, in, in Ecuador, in Quito, and I exchanged a few of one of my concerts for a painting from a, a very famous painter now whose name is Villasis. And uh, I consider that uh, I needed the money <laughs> also very much, but uh, the, the painting was something very important to me. And uh, I saw it in a gallery in Quito, and uh, I got to know the artist personally. So I bought the painting instead of the money. <laughs> what about, we're getting back to music. Uh, you're going to be doing all the sonatas of Mozart. What affinity do you have for Mozart? Why did you choose that? I have been always very much uh, a student of the classics, of the, the classical composers, Haydn and Mozart especially. And uh, during my first uh, European tour, for instance, I, I played very much uh, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. And uh, I thought that it was about time that here in Tallahassee uh, the entire cycle of the Mozart sonatas was done. I think also that the entire cycle of the Beethoven sonatas should be done, and I am intending to do that also uh, in, in the near future. And uh, I feel very close to Mozart's work, and uh, I always played it, and I always uh, try to achieve a real high level in my performance, in my performances of, of Mozart. So this is an opportunity now that I have of exploring the entire uh, literature of the, the sonata for the piano. Okay, this is your studio where you determine the scores that you're going to be playing and talking about Mozart. How does the virtuosity of Mozart, a, a technical demands affect your playing and, and your own being? I always said that in order to play anything at a very high level, you have got first to play Mozart, to be able to play Mozart. And at the same time, playing Mozart, I consider, is one of the most difficult things that uh, an interpreter can do. Uh, you are so exposed in every sense uh, to, to, uh, to, to all the elements of, uh, of music you, and, and uh, the audience is exposed to a, a singing line that is accompanied practically by, by another very thin line that uh, your senses must be at the height, that your powers must be at the very height uh, children cannot play Mozart. They play Mozart because uh, it looks like uh, it's simpler, but it is not. I, I, I learned, I found out that uh, the hard way, that it's one of the most difficult composers. As a matter of fact, in the first program I'm playing uh, on Monday the 13th of February, uh, I'm playing a sonata that I played when I was uh, four years old. It, the, the little C major sonata, for, uh, Kegel 545. And throughout the years I saw, I saw what the, finally, what the, the, the and I, I'm not sure I saw what finally the real sonata is. Maybe when I will be 60 years old, my conception will be a little bit different. I hope so. So that that is the problem with uh, with a composer such as this. Musically, I think he's uh, extremely deep and, 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 and his conception is very uh, rich musically and uh, uh, it's very difficult to try to convey a deep thought and he put into his music many deep thoughts, very, very many deep thoughts into such a little amount of notes that's why uh, practically each note has a meaning here. 
And that, that, that I hope, uh, answers your question. Family farms have long been considered to be the cornerstones of agriculture and the great American heritage. For agriculture to survive, family farms must continue to be and will need to be important. On tonight's People's Show, we'll be finding out what it's like to be a farm family in Leon County as we visit with Leon County's Farm Family of the Year, the J.L. Morgan family. Really, I, I guess I'd have to consider myself a small farmer since uh, my acreage involves what it does is roughly 225 acres. So I guess in farm, that would be a small farm category. Well, how long have you been farming? Uh, well, of course, I grew up on a farm, but uh, uh, full-time, what I'd call full-time farming, uh, probably about nine or ten years. Uh, of course, I started on a, what you'd call a green thumb basis. <laughs> Uh, just started with uh, one tractor and uh, a very small amount, just uh, a few acres, and, and just gradually expanded year by year until I got to the point that I am now. You don't make your main living as a farmer. Why, why is that? Uh, well, I guess that once, uh, uh, once a person has uh, been on the farm, as, as long as I have, uh, grown up on the farm, I guess it really, uh, it's hard to get it out of his system. Well, it's hard to get it out of your blood, so to speak, and I just, uh, I guess I just uh, I took it from there and, and more or less got into the uh, small-time farm as a, as a sideline, as a hobby. And of course, it's expensive equipment and so forth. It's expensive now. It can't remain a hobby long. In other words, you either have to get in or you have to get out. And basically, I just got in deep enough that uh, I was... Uh, I just had to get a little bit deeper to be able to stay in, and I was too far in to get out, really, about what it amounted to. So I just expanded year by year until I got to, to the point that I am now. Well, about this machinery you have, you know, this is a very expensive piece <laughs> to operate or just to have, period. What, do you have to have this to farm, or what would they do before when they have these, this modern uh, machinery? Well, uh, farming uh, primarily depended on hand labor for so many years. 
uh, back when they did it with livestock rather than with uh, uh, mechanical equipment. And uh, nowadays, uh, if you do, if you, if you go, the time that's involved to be able to beat weather and, and uh, to take advantage of, of uh, reasonable market prices, you have to be able to move faster and, and so forth. And also, you can't get the amount of labor you need to. You used to could get somebody to break corn by hand, but not any longer. A machine like this, while one of them uh, uh, runs anywhere from, uh, for the small ones, uh, from say $25,000 up to $60,000, $70,000 per unit, uh, they still, the labor savings and so forth, and the speed with which you can move, it's still a worthwhile investment. If you go in the farm, you just have to do it. And of course, when I first bought my first uh, combine, I, I did a custom combine and I didn't have enough uh, acreage to really warrant a combine. But uh, I, I went ahead and bought it and did enough custom combining to assist me in being able to make the payments that was involved. And then, of course, I traded for a larger combine, which I have here. Uh, farm equipment's high. Seems like that uh, uh, the prices continue to rise for the farmer just uh, uh, day in and day out, not year in and year out, but day in and day out. And that's what really is taking place in farm equipment. To say you have to have it, in a way, you do have to have it. Well, do you feel a threat by, say, government or large farm corporations p to make you keep up with advancing technology and also all this new equipment just so you can survive? Uh, if I were depending on the farm, I, I'd, I'd have to answer affirmative yes, but uh, I, of course I'm not depending just on the farm to, to make a living, but uh, I think that not just uh, looking at it from the standpoint of corporations and what have you, or, or, or big farms, in other words, uh, what, which uh, really that you've got a conglomerate uh, very similar to you have in uh, industry, but uh, I think that, uh, that our strong point in our country has been, uh, is agriculture. That's one very strong point that we have, and I think that these advances uh, have uh, been brought about by the fact that uh, uh, that that's strong with us, and we take advantage of them because uh, uh, we can be more competitive. I can be com more competitive on a small basis. In other words, if I can pick my corner of this combine and pick three or four more farmers' corner of this combine, then it justifies owning it. In other words, I can justify the expense that's involved. Not every year be a year like this year. I would certainly hope not. This has not been one of the best years for the farmer. All of us in this area have quite some hard knocks uh, from the standpoint of... Uh, drought and worm damage and uh, this new fungus that hadn't given us any trouble before to, uh, of any degree, which is, I believe, called alpha toxin, but it, uh, it uh, has given us some trouble this year. But every year wouldn't be like this year. Normally, I would still be probably busy as I could be with this combine picking corn, but I'm not doing anything right now with it. I've just got it more or less in hiding until next season. Keeping house clean, washing clothes, and and cooking, and then uh, when a vegetable time I come, I get out there in the car, a garden, and pick uh, a vegetable. Now we, uh, that one year uh, that we uh, sold a vegetable, and I, uh, then I, I I was out there all day long, then came home and fixed a lunch. And we would pick about uh, 15 or 20 uh, hampers of peas or beans, whatever we were uh, picking. But I, I still love it. I, I wouldn't do without it. Oh, what, are you, what are you doing right now? I'm, I'm making a butter. Do you make a lot of the for Do you use a lot of food that you, on the farm? That you I use? make about eight pounds a week. And I, I, the cow I milk, I give about uh, three gallons a day. And then uh, I, uh, I skim the uh, cream off of it and make a uh, butter. What about the rest of the um, food that you use for meals? Do you produce it here on the farm? Uh, the most of it, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we raise our, our own stock, and we got the hogs, and uh, we uh, kill out the hogs and uh, and all. And we have uh, killed a, 
Oh, we had the cow uh, killed, and uh, I had our own beef, uh, too. And then uh, the boys and my husband uh, go uh, hunting and kill deer. You have a lot of mouths to feed in this family. Are you able to do it just um, and still be able to make a profit from the farm? Oh, yes, ma'am. Do you consider the farm life a good life? Yes, ma'am. I don't know. <laughs> I, I just I like it. Do you ever feel away from the community that or you're sorry you've never had a lot of community involvement because you live out on a farm? No, ma'am. Uh, I don't care for, uh, for the, uh, a lot of uh, company. I much rather uh, be out here and uh, busy. And I do. I go to school on Monday night, uh, trying to get my uh, uh, GED. And um, I, then on uh, uh, Thursday, I go to a school and I sew some. Trying to learn to sew. <clears throat> Did you feel everything you have here is enough for you? Yes, ma'am. Plenty enough. The family uh, uh, keep me busy all the time. Being a farmer, there are good and bad times, as with any other business. But would you trade it for anything in the world as far as a place to have raised your children? I uh, could safely say that a uh, farm's a good place to bring up children. Uh, I think that country boys and country girls, uh, as such, have opportunities to view things that maybe uh, you don't have an opportunity to in the more crowded areas. Uh, there's a little, little different little, uh, situation, maybe a little more closeness to nature, and so forth. I believe it's good, and there's usually things to do, and I think that's the problem today uh, with youth is uh, not having enough activities, enough responsibilities, things in which they can take pride in, and say, yes, I'm a part of that. I'm dependent. Uh, they're depending on me to do that, and uh, so forth. Learn responsibilities and how to do things. I, I think that it's a good place to bring them up. I wouldn't trade. I'd have to say I wouldn't trade places. In town, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of friends up there, but out here, there's a lot more things to do, like working on the tractors or just fooling around with the other kids. And there's just a lot to do around here. I can go hunting out there in the woods or play baseball up there in the field. And there's a lot to do around here. I like it a lot better out here. Do you think you have more advantages over than over the kids that live in town? I don't really know. Oh yeah, I reckon so. Cause after school, they ain't really got nothing to do unless they have something up there at the school. But out here, you know, you can do anything you want to. Play around. You can go out in the woods and just mess around out there. Work around the field. I got a lot of experience out here on the field and. I, didn't have uptown. Like, like what do you do out in the field? Like, well, it really depends. If we're working in the hay, I drive the tractor. Or I help lift the hay onto the trucks or drive the trucks or something like that. Or if we're planting, I do about the same. I help around the house mostly, mow the yard, rake the leaves, do things like that. Not really hard things. Why not? Not um, strong enough for something like that yet? No, no. I can't do that. <laughs> I can't work in the hay and lift them bales. When do you think you'll be able to do that? Are you looking forward to it or not? Yes, ma'am. I hope I can. Why do you like living on a farm? Mm, it's fun. You can play around it's just like my other brother said. You can work, play in the field out there. Um, go out there hunting in the woods. I have a lot of fun. What do the girls do on the farm? Work. <laughs> we have to keep the house clean for my dad. And, oh, we help in the field sometimes, and we just sometimes I go out and pick peas and stuff like that. And just that's about all. <laughs> do you, Do you like it? Yeah, it's fun. You, it's fun living on a farm. You uh, have enough to keep you busy and not go out and get into too much trouble. <laughs> Do you feel you have any advantages or disadvantages over your friends in town? The advantage of having something to do all the time. And the disadvantages are I don't get to participate in a lot of things at school that I'd like to. But 
well, like, this can't be held. <laughs> Why don't you? Because of where you live? Uh, because of where I live, and uh, I've got my responsibilities at home and stuff like that. Are there a lot of farm family traditions that you have to keep as far as the work is concerned? No, not necessarily, not I can think of. And do you do the work because you enjoy it or because you know it's got to be done and it's all part of a team effort? Well, it depends on what I'm doing. Sometimes I do it because I want to and sometimes I do it because I have to, <laughs> most of the time. What about later in life? Do you uh, want to live in a situation similar to the one you grew up in? Yeah, maybe not as many kids, but I want to live out and not in the city. <laughs> they say that farming is the good life. Why? Uh, farming, I, I don't know exactly where that phrase come from. Uh, there's good days and bad days. There's hard times and there's good times. Uh, it's the good life when everything's going good because a uh, farmer's an independent businessman. Uh, in other words, he works on his own. And uh, he can do good uh, depending on uh, the season, depending on prices and so forth. Uh, but it's uh, the, the closeness to nature and so forth. And uh, personally, I like it so well. I guess to me it's just part of me. But I really like it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade doing it even on a part-time basis. Though Uncle Sam don't consider me part-time, but I consider myself part-time. Uh, but uh, it's still the good life in that you're on your own. There's things that we uh, we do and uh, we have fun together. There's recreational opportunities involved on the farm. There's uh, savings as far as uh, uh, food and so forth is concerned. Uh, uh, this, this is a big help to us. Uh, so I guess maybe lumping all those things together would be the good life.